welcome to the December 11th, 2014 meeting of the Northampton School Committee. Uh, I will begin the meeting by asking the clerk to call the roll of the school committee. Ms. Budaval? Present. Ms. Laura Fallon? Present. Ms. Pam Hanna? Present. Ms. Ann Hennessy? Present. Mr. Downey Meyer? Present. Ms. Mr. Howard Moore? Here. Ms. Karen Nicholson? Here. Mr. Ed Zahowski? Present. And Mayor David Nurkis? Present. Your Honor, you have a quorum. Okay. As, as is our custom, we'll begin tonight with our public comment period. And uh, we have a sign-up sheet. And I note we have one member of the public uh, who has signed up, uh, Stephanie Grimaldi. And so if I could just ask you to state your name and address for the record, and, uh, and you have three minutes to uh, address the school committee. OK. Stephanie Grimaldi, 42, Cloud of Blackstone Circle. Um, so I'm here tonight just to uh, be a reminder about uh, hockey fees for subsequent athletic fees in general. Um, I know that athletic fees are going to be part of the budget process moving forward, so a precursor. So I'm hopeful that a fair and equitable athletic fee for Northampton hockey players can be established through the budget process this year. I understand that hockey is a co-op program managed primarily through East Hampton High School, and with that comes some challenges to how directly our athletic department can manage it financially. So I don't want the Northampton athletic budget to pay for hockey on the backs of other sports, nor do I want hockey to be treated significantly differently um, than the other 25 plus teams at Northampton <coughs> High School. I and other hockey parents fully understand that hockey is more expensive than many of the other sports and have never flinched at paying twice the standard fee. But I have to wonder if it's more than twice as expensive per player as the most expensive sport at Northampton High School that pays a $175 athletic fee. As part of trying to understand why this substantial fee increase had been proposed, several general questions regarding the costs associated with athletics and allocation of funds arose for me. Specific questions were sent to school committee members in an email earlier this week. While I don't know the answers to all these questions, it would seem that there's a level of variability for what the budget can fund across and within athletic teams from year to year. It seems there is some room for flexibility in determining what a fair player contribution is. I am also hopeful that we will not be short-sighted regarding the fee. It's probably true that the number of Northampton players will not dramatically increase over the next year or two. But it would be surprising to me if the numbers did not increase significantly over three to five years if the rapid growth of the local Nonatuck youth hockey program is indi any indication. When my son played youth hockey, he switched between the Nonatuck and Amherst programs because there were not enough kids in his age group playing consistently to have a team. This year, there are six full competitive teams between the ages of 7 and 14, as well as a busy learn to skate, learn to play program. This is significant because I assume that the per player net cost to Northampton High School would decrease as an increase in, with an increase in players. A prohibitive fee could stifle this increase. I hope that if the decision is made to raise the hockey fee it to uh, in excess of twice the standard fee, that families would be given a full and complete detailed accounting for the costs and budget, uh, the expenditures in comparison with other sports. I also hope that the full amount of any fee paid would count toward the annual family athletic fee cap. And as an FYI, our first home game is this Wednesday night, 7 o'clock. We're playing Belchertown High School, and we're going to be at Williston. So come join us. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> is there anyone else who wishes to speak during the public comment? OK, hearing none, uh, announcements from the school committee. Any announcements? I'd like to make an announcement. <clears throat> I would like to thank all of the citizens of Northampton who participated yesterday in Valley Gives. All of our schools benefited. And um, Jackson Street School, I really want to say um, they're incredible. They raised over $17,000 last time I looked. Over twenty-four. Over 24000 with all the prizes that they won because of participation. And it doesn't have to be a, grand, a, a large amount of money. Um, the t every $10 mattered. And what it did was it put them, um, it was unique donors, and it also allowed for an extra thousand dollars for um, golden tickets. And I think Jackson Street also won that. So we were very lucky that way. But I want to thank all the citizens of Northampton, and remind remind you that next Wednesday here at JFK, um, the band will be performing their Christmas show. So everybody's invited, and I believe it begins at seven o'clock. It's a three dollar suggested donation. Nobody's turned away. Anybody can walk in, and we have bake sale and um, maybe even a 50-50 raffle. So it should be a lot of fun. Thank you. Any other announcements? Oh. 
Um, Mary Savarese, who um, does technology work at uh, Bridge Street and Jackson Street School, I saw her this week, and she told me that there were um, a number of students who participated in the Hour of Code. Um, so it was a nationwide program. So I just want to congratulate everyone uh, who did that. Any other announcements? Okay, we'll move into the um, into recommended actions, and uh, tonight's consent agenda includes. Uh, the approval of minutes of the school committee meeting of no November 13th, 2014, uh, minutes of the negotiating subcommittee for December 4th, 2014. It includes a contract with Forbes Snyder Tri-State Cash Register, uh, our cafeteria point of sale system for $14,360. We also have several field trip requests. Uh, the Boys and Girls Ski Club going to Mount Snow in West Dover, Vermont, January 25th, 2015. The Prevention Coalition going to the CADCA Conference in Washington, D.C., February 1st through the 5th of 2015. Bridge Street, 5th grade, Nature's Classroom, Beckett, Massachusetts, April 7th through the 10th, 2015. And finally, the 8th grade chorus students who will be going to see Aladdin on Broadway in New York City, April 15th, 2015. And I would ask for a motion to approve the consent agenda. Make a motion to accept the uh, consent agenda as presented. I, I'd like to pull something out of it. Okay. We could. I would like to, um, the Prevention Coalition field trip request, I have some questions on that. Okay. Thank you. So uh, we'll pull that off. Um, <coughs> Any other concerns about the consent agenda as presented? <clears throat> Hearing none, all those in favor of the consent agenda as amended, uh, say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so why don't we then uh, focus uh, on the uh, Prevention <laughs> Coalition uh, field trip? And I don't know if we have a representative who can speak to that. Did you, uh, would you like to come forward to the? To hear everything she has to say first. Okay. <laughs> That would be great if you could just identify yourself. So, um, My name is Ananda Lennox. I'm the Youth Engagement Coordinator for the Northampton Prevention Coalition. Do you need to know where I live or anything? <laughs> I can't really Did you want to just well. discuss the, um, the field trip? Sure. Um, ADCA stands for Communities Against Drugs Coalitions of America. Are you? Oh, yeah, you're blue. You did the PSA with us last yes, year. Yes, Yeah, I recognize yeah. you. Okay. So anyhow, Jonathan Latendra is the student that would like to go. He did the summer program, which was a national youth leadership initiative training. And now that he's, are you 19 officially now? So now he's old enough to do the adult program, and he's been very interested in public health and substance abuse prevention. So we have funding to bring him. And so what he's planning on doing this time, it's a the travel is the first through the fifth, but the conference is actually just the second through the fifth. We just had to have time to get there. Um, what Jonathan will be doing while we're there is doing the complete training program for all of the regular coalition members. So he's going to be learning about like how to set up strategic initiatives for addressing you know, specific community, specific drug issues and stuff like that. There'll also be... Um, I don't think there'll be as many public speaking opportunities for you as this one, but it's just going to be more of a leadership and educational opportunity for him. And we're really excited to bring him because he's been showing interest in this work for, this is starting his second year now. And um, he'd like to continue working with the Prevention Coalition after, even after he graduates. So we are trying to do all that we can to help him on his path. Okay, so um, I, I guess, <coughs> I read it and it seems wonderful. I read the I read the agenda. I read the trip. I think it's a wonderful opportunity. My question, and I do understand that he went previously. My question is, um, how was Jonathan chosen? I mean, are there other people that might be interested? Is it something that can be more of an expansive program? Sure. And we, and with the funding, is it just our, the grant? Our, yeah, we have. We only have a specific amount of money we can use for travel and for conferences. So within our coalition, like I would be going, the coalition leader is going, the director is going, and then a board of health member is going. So we usually at most have a budget for one or two students to go per year. The reason that we're taking him this time is because he'd express an interest in turning this into a career choice. We do have younger students that would probably like to go, but most of it, we, he's been pulled from our group called the Teen Advocacy Group. <clears throat> Sorry, I have a cold. And um, most of our members last year were freshmen at that point. And so traveling with them just, there was a lot of, 
questions about maturity level and whether parents would need to come and stuff like that. So that was one of the barriers. Um, the other was just that Jonathan, being one of our few upperclassmen, showed a lot of maturity and sincere, long-standing interests. So we felt like it would, he would be a safe, good bet for continuing this form of education. And we're hoping to use him. He's been helping to co-facilitate the advocacy group. So our idea is that he's going to create this kind of legacy that the younger students can then follow as they get older each year and have it be something that they aspire to. And um, I guess you kind of answered my other question that being 19, um, where was he going to be taking this? And you see yourself um, in a career and, and actually working with the, the Prevention Coalition afterwards? Yes, I do. I'm also um, actually I'm currently working with them right now, too. Um, I'm their social media person, social media guy. And um, as I, I would just love to work with them even more further. Uh, whatever opportunities they have for me after I, even after I graduate. What do you hope to do with this experience that you're going to be getting? And you know, because I mean, you're not going to be a senior next year, right? You're going to be coming back and helping from external. What do you hope to be doing? Um, do you do work with the other kids? I mean, how, I just don't understand. No, yeah, I would. Um, I would love to work with um, the other kids at the high school as well, and um, and in my community as well, and get and from the training that I get from this trip, I would like to bring that back to the high school and, and show, um, show kids at, you know, at the high, not just at the high school, but in our community that there's a, there's a different path than just using drugs to get anywhere. And I, I hope that, that that's my goal. That's my goal. I think it sounds like a wonderful opportunity for you. And it's wonderful that at this point that you know where your focus, or at least you believe you know where your focus wants to be. Um, when you come back, is there some way that we can have you come in and do a little presentation as far as what you've taken from it or what, you know, I mean, something, just a little, you know, thanks for letting me go and this is what I got from it. No, yeah, I would love I'd to. I'd love to hear what you got from it. No, I would love to give a presentation on it afterwards and give my experiences and what I've learned and what I got back from it. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Cool. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. And I just want to state that um, I attended the Northampton Prevention Coalition um, annual retreat and Jonathan presented um, what he had learned from the conference last year so okay. I would have loved to have seen that yeah. so is there a motion to approve this I uh, have to approve okay is there a second second any more discussion hearing none all those in favor say aye aye, aye. aye. opposed any abstentions thank you very much for for being here sure Okay, um, with that complete, we now turn to Jonathan uh, <laughs> as our uh, student representative on the school committee uh, to give his uh, student representative report. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so progress reports are going home uh, Tuesday, December 16th. Uh, the Northampton High School's annual poetry slam is uh, being held during periods two and period four, depending on how many people sign up, on December 18th. You know, if a student wants to be a part of the Poetry Slam, they have to submit a poem by tomorrow. And since it's a school-sanctioned event, it has to be school-appropriate. No swears or anything. <clears throat> um, the Poetry Slam is oh, Monday, December 22nd, during fourth period. Uh, teachers who sign up, there will be a holiday, um, holiday chorus performance. Uh, the Paint Box Theater has a show coming up called All New Adventures of Santa Claus. It has more than 25 NHS students involved, and the showings are going to be Friday, December 19th, Saturday, December 20th, and Sunday, December 21st. <laughs> the holiday break is coming up. Students, the uh, students' last day at the high school is December 23rd, and they come back to school Monday, January 5th. First period classes are collecting money, um, money donations for the uh, Toys for Tots campaign. 23 children are being sponsored this year and the toys will be delivered to them December 18th. Um, Ms. Strauss's first period English class is um, sponsoring a school-wide food drive with a goal of 500 pounds of food. Currently, they have about a barrel and a half full, and they have uh, all next week, too. <coughs> the class of 2016 is hosting a dance for seventh graders at the high school, um, date and time to be announced. And um, the class of 2016 is also partnering with the uh, Soka Club 
to host the second annual winter, winter semi-formal. Um, it's gonna be at the Northampton Country Club and we hope to have it January 16th. Um, the Blue Devils wrestling team um, will be attending their first meet this Saturday in Athol, Massachusetts. Um, the first big game of the season for boys basketball will be this Saturday at the, um, at the cage in Amherst against Amherst Pelham, I think that says Pelham. I don't know if that's, I'm pronouncing that right. Um, the, it will start at 7.30. And um, there's gonna be a winter, in, winter concert at the high school in the auditorium uh, January 14th. And I believe it's gonna be during class, classes. Thank you very much for your report. Thank you. Uh, okay, we now turn to a um, vote um, to accept, uh, generously accept, uh, NEF uh, Northampton Education Foundation small grant awards. And I believe Dale Melcher is here uh, representing NEF to present, uh, to present this, uh, this group of uh, small grant awards. Great, thank you very much. I'm Dale Melcher, I'm on the NEF board and I am the current chair of the Small Grants Committee. So it is our pleasure to recommend to you funding for 10 grants. I believe you all received them. So I'm not gonna describe them but I am going to name them for the record. The first grant is to Bridge Street School uh, for the third year for the Bridge Street Garden Project. Uh, this is year three for this grant, and it's a grant for $790. The second grant, also at Bridge Street School, and also in its third year, uh, is Celebrate the World, and it's a grant for $1,000. The third grant is for Leeds School to bring Tony Vaca to the school as an artist in residence, and that's a grant for $2,800. Um, I'd just like to call to your attention that this is the first grant cycle under our new guidelines, we have raised the grant cap from $2,000 to $3,000. Having heard from teachers that $2,000 just doesn't go as far as it used to. <laughs> so since we, in the past 15 years, haven't raised it, that seemed reasonable. Uh, the fourth grant is to uh, Ryan Road for community-based literacy, and it's a grant for $1,750. Grant five is also to Ryan Road. It's called Journey of the Art for $1,600. Um, the sixth grant also to Ryan Road is for a project called Transforming STEM to STEAM, uh, and that's a grant for $2,908. The seventh grant is here at the middle school. It's a mural project, and that's for the full $3,000. Grant eight is for the high school to continue the robotics team. This is year three of their grant and we've awarded them $1,000. The ninth grant um, is also for the high school and it's for the English Language Learners Community Learning Project and this grant is for $300. Uh, the last grant uh, goes to the Early Education Program. It's called Tools of the Mind, and that's a grant for $2,975. So the Education Foundation is delighted to fund these grants and requests your <coughs> approval to do so. Well, we're, we're, we're delighted to have these wonderful small grants in front of us this <coughs> evening to vote on for approval. Um, I can't say how much the school committee and uh, the Northampton Public Schools in general are so grateful for NEF, yourself, and all that you do to make these grants possible for our teachers and students. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank I'd you. I'd like to shout out to my co-board member. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Move to accept okay. the grant. So there's a motion, motion made to accept, uh, accept these grants. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any further, uh, any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? The motion carries. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Dale. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Um, 
We now move on to an update uh, from, uh, from Nancy Cheevers on the professional development calendar. I believe this is a multimedia presentation, so I will uh, move out of your way. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here tonight to briefly share um, the district's professional development progress. Um, our key PD goals are to create a professional development calendar for the entire school community, to increase differentiated instruction across all grades, especially in math and ELA, English language arts, to provide professional development for curriculum unit design district-wide, to provide teachers and ESPs with opportunities to discuss instruction and unit design, and to provide teachers with instruction on how to use MCAS data to improve instruction. Firstly, Angel Rhoda and I created the PD calendar. Anyone may access the calendar on the Northampton Public School website. The instructions um, that you see on the slide will lead you to the calendar, and I believe all the school committee members have a, have a uh, copy of that. You will also see additional workshops and courses available to teachers, administrators, and staff. For example, this is the January PD calendar. You can't quite see the last week on this slide, but you can see January 7th, for example. There's a release day for math and special education teachers, grades six through eight. The topic will be differentiated instruction, and our provider will be our local educational collaborative. Next, I'll address our progress with differentiation and unit plans. The two specific goals for differentiation include the creation of units to reflect content, process, and product. And, and the other is to uh, identify software for supporting differentiated instruction. These are some of our activities. Dr. Imbo, uh, Dr. Marcia Imbo, was with us for three full days, spending two full days with ELA and math teachers, grades six through nine. <coughs> and our entire district has participated in two PLCs using Carol Tomlinson's book, Differentiation in the Brain. Mike Morris, the associate superintendent over in Amherst, gave an administrative workshop on providing meaningful feedback to teachers engaged in differentiated instruction. This is part of our ongoing training and attention to the teacher evaluation process. And finally, we are slated to begin intensive workshops on differentiation with the collaborative uh, starting in January. I prepared this slide using our new district-wide curriculum writing software. This slide shows the progress each department has made adding differentiated instructional components to unit plans. This is based on two PD days, although some departments have had some additional release time. EL May is making outstanding progress in this area based on the quantitative criteria. This slide lists unit design goals, how to write curriculum that promotes deep understanding, create assessments that accurately measure student growth, and how to use the ATLAS program to accomplish all of the above. In order to accomplish these goals, we've trained with our ATLAS designer <coughs> through the summer and fall. Teachers and administrators have had and will continue deep discussions concerning differentiated instruction and unit design. Teachers are in the process of creating unit plans on PD and unit days. And we are looking forward to sharing unit drafts with, part, with partner districts. This slide shows that district teachers have 783 units in various stages of progress since September. This is very encouraging data. 
This slide demonstrates progress in math by grade level. It looks like the sixth grade has about 19 units in progress. This slide also demonstrates the elementary focus in math. This chart represents the district progress in ELA by grade level. You'll notice that the focus here is 7 through 12, as elementary teachers have been engaged in math units. The challenge for our elementary teachers, of course, is that they teach every subject. This chart demonstrates the organization of units in an eighth grade history class over a year. This is a unit calendar. Each unit is aligned with standards, and additionally, our ATLAS program can run reports demonstrating the number of standards addressed in a course within a content area and or across grade levels. These are the key features of our PD this year, but I've listed a few others for you here. This is, these are the only things I could fit on the slide. I probably could have had 10 slides. The most exciting of all of these to me is the creation of the curriculum teacher leader positions for the district. CLTs will engage in additional and deeper training and then share their expertise and experiences with grade level colleagues and departments. These positions are open to teachers grades K through 12. However, it's a key role for our elementary teachers as there are no department chairs in elementary schools. We are presently taking applications and look forward to working with teacher leaders starting in January. And finally, it is my sincere privilege to work with the teachers, instructional fact, uh, faculty, and administrative leaders. They are truly exceptional. None of the progress you see today would be possible without their dedication, professionalism, and willingness to try something new. Thank you. <laughs> Do folks have questions for Dr. Cheevers? Uh, uh, Dr. Cheevers? <laughs> Mr. Meyer. I've had a couple questions. The first one was how will we be evaluating the implementation of the new units? How will administrative staff be in a classroom to observe the degree with which differentiation of the principles of understanding by design are being faithfully implemented according to the Excellent question. Very glad you asked it. We have a variety of steps in place. Firstly, we have our teacher evaluation program. And teacher evaluation from administrators um, working with teachers is designed to do exactly that. There are, there are rubrics involved for teacher evaluation that are specifically lined up with understanding by design. Understanding by design is our unit design for the district, but it's also the design that's used statewide and actually across the country. So everything works together, the teacher evaluation, the understanding by design, and the differentiated instruction. Differentiated instruction is one of our priority elements in the district, and it's included in the rubrics um, for teacher evaluations, as well as in every uh, school improvement plan as well as a district improvement plan. And there are also rubrics that will be devised for all of the unit plans that are based on UBD. Another question was, um, as far as the new unit plans, are they freely available to all teaching personnel within the district? Because I saw that you, you desi you're obviously working with Angelo and it's, you know, I've always thought as a teacher, I just like looking at other people's lesson plans. I like looking at other units. It doesn't even have to be in my subject area, and it doesn't have to be in my grade level. I'm wondering to what extent are we building a warehouse of, of curricula and of units that everyone in the district can access and, and basically improve their practice through that? That's what our software program is all about. That's, what, that's the whole goal of Atlas. 
Atlas is a program whereby every single teacher in the district will be able to look at every single unit plan. So for example, if I am a seventh grade English language arts teacher, I can look at the sixth grade program and see exact, I could actually even run a report to find out how many times a particular standard has been taught in the sixth grade. I could even run a report to find out what, how many times the standard is taught in the sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. I can look at how it's taught. I can look at the individual lessons. We're not at the lesson level yet. We're still writing units. But if eventually, you will be able to look at the lesson plans. You will be able to look at the resources and see how it is that they relate to one another across grade levels. So all of the units are available across schools, across the district, for every single teacher. Do you have any way of telling from the software whether teachers are using that ability to, you know, because again, it, it's one of those things that it might even be, you know, I think part of your professional development plan would be to bring exemplars that have been generated within the district. I mean, again, because it's great to have the ability, but maybe people sometimes are too busy and don't know where to look in the universe of plans. Well, there are lots of exemplars that will be available because we are tapped into Atlas Worldwide. Atlas Worldwide is a storehouse of exemplary unit plans. We have access to uh, about five of those per teacher, and then after we've used five, the teachers are asked to provide one of the exemplars. So that's one way that we're accessing others, other plans and comparing and contrasting. The other thing that's planned are across cross-district um, PLCs. We have some plans with some other school systems to get together and to review each other's uh, unit plans as well. But in terms of the teacher in the classroom, um, an administrator should be very aware of where that lesson is in the given unit plan. A teacher should be able to say, well, this is the unit that I'm teaching. This is the lesson plan from that unit, and here are the standards. This is how it's all connected. Um, that should be part of everyday teaching, and I, I think it pretty much is um, across the board. Thank you. Are there questions for Dr. Cheevers? Um, I had two, but one was answered by Mr. Meyer. The other one was, um, <coughs> You said that you were taking applications already for the CLT, the um, curricu Curriculum Teacher Leaders. Yes. Um, have you gotten, um, received a lot of interest that way? Yes, actually. Many teachers are very interested. Um, and uh, we're really looking forward to holding some interviews um, before we leave for vacation. That's the goal. We'll see. It's a very ambitious goal um, that I'd really like to start with the teacher leader training in, in January. And what do you see that, the, I mean, what are they training? I mean, I understand somewhat, but I mean, more specifically. The question is lousy, but. Under I, I understand Thanks. what I think you want. Um, for example, um, our Atlas program. There are lots of bells and whistles with this Atlas program. There's going to be a composium, an institute that it will happen, I think it's in February. I think it would be great if, our, if a core of teacher leaders would go to this particular training and really learn how to run reports so that they can use those reports to generate information so that teachers can learn. They can take that back to their departments, back to their grade levels, and teachers can learn more about what they're teaching, how they're teaching, what they're missing, perhaps, um, and maybe what standards are being taught more than once and maybe too much. Um, how many curriculum teacher leaders are you looking for? I mean, how many, like one, one, what will their responsibilities be? How expansive? In the elementary school, I'd really love to have curriculum leaders for each grade from each school. I'd love to have four or five curriculum leaders for each of the schools of the elementary schools. Um, in the middle school, I think it would be ideal to have a curriculum leader for each department. Um, and, uh, and then the same is true for the high school. Um, but I think that there will be teachers who will wear more than one hat. For example, you might have an English teacher who's also a special ed teacher who can fulfill both of those um, areas of expertise. You might find a technology teacher who also is a math teacher and can fulfill those, those needs. So um, I think we're going to see who we get 
um, based on the the uh, applicants that I have, um, it's very very encouraging so far. So does this look like something that um, when these people say yes and they sign up for this or sign on to this, is it something that they're going to be um, expanding on each year or next year or the year after we're going to send another group and we're going to, I mean, is it, is it a rotating or is it something that we're hoping to be kind of fixed so that people can go to or? Um, I think we haven't had that discussion yet. I think at this point we're thinking that for now, this is what we're going to do. We're going to train these people. I'd like to think that the same people would be interested in the summer and in the fall. But I think that's a conversation we need to have with the PD committee and with the superintendent and administrative leadership team to see how this works, how it functions with the elementary uh, teachers and, and all of the schools. We've never done this before. It's uh, an exciting new new idea. So we'll try it out and we'll review it and, um, and we'll make adjustments. Um. Another question is, um, are the C are they, um, CLTs compensated? Is there a compensation? Yes. Yeah. We have, um, we have several grants, and one of which is the Title II grant. Title II is about professional development, and this is actually the perfect use of Title II professional development money. Okay. Um, I want to thank you very much. I really want to thank you for um, the presentation. It was very clear and very, very thorough. and. Um, didn't really require a lot of questions except for that. And thank you very much for everything that you've been doing. Thank You're doing you. great. Thank you. It's my sincere <laughs> pleasure. Okay. Thank you very much. Hey, actually, oh, actually, sorry. sorry. One, yeah, one more. One more. <coughs> really quick. Are oh. Two questions. Are teachers required to input um, units in this? Is that a requirement? It is a requirement that they learn how to do it. Okay. All of the teachers, and it's important that all teachers know um, how to create units so that they know the process and that they understand um, they understand the theoretical um, framework of, of creating unit plans. That's really important. Is it necessary for every single teacher to be a curriculum writer? No, and probably not everybody wants to be a curriculum writer. But I think it's important for everyone to know how to do it. Yeah, I'm, I guess I'm <clears throat> questioning the up, putting the uploading onto Atlas. Mm -hmm. That's not a requirement. Well, if we have a PD day and teachers are working in teams, we're asking them to yeah. fulfill that. Oh, so in a right. team of teachers, yep. we're not asking anyone to sit down by themselves and you know to, to accomplish a whole unit by themselves. So no teacher is saying you have to input 10 units by the end of the year. Oh, absolutely okay. not, no. And my second question, thank you, uh, <laughs> is are teachers part of this ultimate evaluation of this, of how Atlas is being used? And Because I like the data. like. Downey said these standards, are they part of that? Oh, absolutely. First of all, we have our PD committee and, you know, we're actively engaging with them, you know, and, um, and secondly, I think teachers are a part of it because um, we are going to be using these rubrics. We're going to try out the rubrics. We're going to be looking at the, um, the units. We're going to look at the fidelity of the units and how they line up with the standards. We may even find that we make some adjustments with our program. There might be things that um, we would like Atlas to do differently or maybe an adjustment on our, our district template. Right. So it's all part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you. You're welcome. I have a question though, sure. to, to follow up on that. Um, Atlas is worldwide. It's it's statewide, you know, district wide, and worldwide. And you put five in, and then we expect to, you know, write an exemplar ourselves mm -hmm. or whomever once they've used it. Um, I don't know how to ask the question. I mean, with with it being so used, is it new? I mean, that we have to keep building on it. Doesn't it have some sort of really solid base already if it's being used worldwide? I mean. The program itself, yeah, the software program itself is, is, has been around for quite some time and used successfully actually by many of our, our dis other local districts and, and in the state. And as a matter of fact, one of the state programs um, has actually modeled itself after, after Atlas. Um, and there, was, there were a core of us that actually looked at a variety of software programs and we looked at all of the features and by far Atlas was the best program in terms of its features, its friendliness, um, and the uh, and in the way that the, the the software program is organized. And do you find that the teachers who are using it or starting to use it um, are, are 
find it to be friendly? I mean, because I know that there's a, a varying degree of there. Yes. I think based on all of our new software programs, I think Atlas really is the friendliest um, program that we have. It's it's very it's very administratively it's very very friendly, and f from the teacher's point of view, I think it's very friendly. And just one more question: so every teacher has to use Atlas. I mean, that will be part of maybe their yes. teacher evaluation of how Yes. yes. Yeah. OK. We're actually, um, we have <coughs> some plans. Angelo Rota and I have been talking about how it is that we're going to train new teachers. And I think new teachers that come into our district need a variety of technology training now. And we need to extend that and, and have some discussion about how to do that. And one of those pieces is that every teacher that comes into the system needs to know how to navigate and use Atlas and you know Oasis, our uh, teacher evaluation software, and all of these things. So it will become part of the technology package that te that uh, new teachers are acclimated to when they come into the okay, system. So new teachers. What about the older teachers that may still be having issues with being able to use a computer? Is it? I mean, is it still very? I are, you, are we finding that? Yeah, I will. I think with um, again with the Atlas, it's more friendly. I think than any of the other software pieces. Oh. And the other piece about Atlas is that, generally speaking, you don't use Atlas by yourself. You use Atlas with a friend or your colleagues or your, or your teammates. So even if someone had some struggles initially with the program, there are people with you that help you through the process. Okay. And it's vertically aligned so we can do it? Vertically and horizontally. And horizontally. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Any other questions for Dr. Cheevers? Thank you very much. Okay. okay, next we'll move on to a vote, and this concerns the um, hockey fee. And we have with us tonight the uh, athletic director, uh, uh, Kara Dupre, is here to present that to us for a vote. Thank you. Good evening. Um, first, I'd like to just give you a brief history of the program and the fees, and then I would like to pre present a recommendation for your approval. Um, Northampton High School became a member of the cooperative um, East Hampton High School hockey team in 2009 when one player decided to join their program. East Hampton High School hosts the cooperative because they are the team or the school that had a hockey program. We host the cooperative, excuse me, they host the cooperative to us and to also to Smith Vocational and Technical High School and Hampshire Regional High School. So there are four programs, four high schools that participate on the same hockey team. Um, they did so because their numbers decreased over time and that they were concerned about participation and being able to maintain their program and so reached out to communities um, hoping that more people would be interested in playing hockey for their, for their school. Um, as East Hampton High School is the host for the program, they do organize all aspects of the program. They're responsible for scheduling, transportation, coaching, ice time, um, game personnel, equipment, et cetera. My responsibility is to register Northampton High School student athletes and to verify their eligibility, academics, attendance, et cetera, health as well. Um, and also to advertise the program in our community so we're having people go to the games and, and cheer on our student athletes. Um, at the end of the season, East Hampton High School writes an invoice that reflects all of the expenses and the gate revenues from the program for the year. They divide the final cost of the program by the number of student athletes participating and then draft an invoice for each school um, to sort of match those numbers. I have invoices from the 2013-14 season, the 2011 and 12 season, and the 2009 and 10 season. I have been unable to, uh, to uh, uncover the seasons in between. I can show those to you for, for more information if you'd like. Um, last year, our total cost for six players to attend was $4,926.06. It was $821 in change per student to participate. That cost include, um, included the gate revenues um, of $3,576 total, so we were credited that money for each one of our students as well. So the total $4,929.06 um, reflected six Northampton High School players participating. Five of those players paid a user fee of, one, of $350. One student qualified for free lunch, and so he um, participated 
without cost. Um, similar, the numbers have been similar over the last three years, somewhere between four and six players, um, with the exception of that very first year when we just had one student athlete participating. This year, we should have seven players participating on the team, two of whom will receive, um, uh, will not have to pay a user fee because they, they qualify for free lunch. In August, I came on board and um, uh, September 18th transitioned from, uh, with the old, uh, with the former, excuse me, um, <laughs> um, athletic director, uh, Jim Miller. At that time, uh, we had transitioned all of our responsibilities, but he's been a great resource for me to reach out to when I've had questions about different uh, decisions that were made in the past or uh, procedures that were, were done. Um, about mid-October, I reached out to him regarding winter sports registration, just to question questions about when I should open registration, and um, a few questions I had about the program we use, Family ID, that's an online program where kids can go on uh, and register themselves for sports. At that time, um, he directed me to change the hockey user fee from $350 to $500. I did so, incorrectly at this point, assuming that a process had been followed for uh, changing the user fee. Um, that process, I assumed, would have included a school committee vote as well as conversations with student athletes, parents, and community members. Um, those conversations didn't happen and obviously made folks very upset because they were hearing it for the first time, or I should say reading it for the first time on the website rather than hearing it or having, a conver having the opportunity for a conversation about it. Um, I was made aware that of this discrepancy um, when I had a conversation with a concerned parent and he wanted to have more, uh, more information about where that number came from and the process that was, um, that was recommended or, or uh, followed to get there. Uh, shortly after that conversation with the parent, I went to Brian Lombardi, principal at the high school, um, asking for some direction on this. At that time, he suggested I leave the $500 fee as advertised, but we needed to do some research to figure out where that number came from. Um, uh, I met with Superintendent Provost um, Candace Walzik and also Brian Lombardi and uh, shortly thereafter and learned that no recommendation had been presented to you um, about the hockey user fees. And uh, we also learned that the current user, user fee structure, which has been in place for the last two years, was also not presented to you for, um, for a vote. That fee structure, um, I, I believe you have this information, but I'll just review it. Um, that fee structure for one school year, uh, a student athlete who'd like to play the first sport, would, it would cost $175. For the second sport, there's a reduction in that fee to $145. And for a third sport, the fee would be $115. For students who receive reduced lunch, or qualify for reduced lunch, that fee is $35 for the first sport, and then $25 for each additional sport after that. The hockey user fee was, it was is $350, which was um, double the, the um, single sport fee. And there's also a family cap of $600 for the year. So if you have multiple students participating in sports, you won't spend more than $600 if, if, uh, if they're playing all three sports and you have two children. There's that cap um, offers an additional discount. The last known approved fee structure, um, as far as we could tell, was three years ago, and that fee structure was $150, $120, and $90. The free and reduced lunch costs were the same at $35 and $25. The family cap was $600, and the hockey user fee was $300. My recommendation for you this evening is that we ratify the current user fee structure um, that has been in place for the last two years but was not officially voted upon, which would include maintaining the hockey user fee at $350. Additionally, um, I would like to build and present to you a formal athletic budget during the budget season that reflects the true cost of running the athletic program at Northampton High School, which also includes a thoughtful recommendation about a user fee 
um, that meets the needs of our athletic budget, but also does not create hardships for our families who are trying to participate in a really positive way in our at our high school. Thank you. Okay. Any uh, questions, hmm. Mr. Pre? Can, can you just clarify when you said um, what portion of the hockey fee would be applied to the family cap? It's only half of their currently. Fee would actually it is go only go half that okay. is applied to the family cap. Yes. Okay, but other sports, it would be one one hundred percent. Would be yes. Okay. So that would be one seventy five. Would go towards the uh, family cap. Family cap, yes. Mm -hmm. Um, there is a discount that takes place for, so if, for example, I have a, a soccer player in the fall and his second sport is hockey in the spring, or excuse me, in the winter, he would receive the $30 deduction for a second sport, so he would actually pay $320 instead of $350, but $175 would still go towards the family cap. Okay. Ms. Duvall? Yeah, um, in 2009, when it was the one student, mm -hmm. do you know um, how much it was then and how much the actual cost was at that time? Because I guess what I'm asking also is there going to be a discount for more students if we have one student in 2009 versus six? That's one question I have. Sure. Um, so in 2009, 2010, the cost per player from East Hampton High School was $882.99. So it didn't really go down very much at all, considering inflation with time. It's now at 821, which mm -hmm. is 882. There were 22 students at that time. What I can see reflected in this, these numbers, as opposed to the numbers I currently have from last year, is that the ice time was cut in half, the cost. So in 2009-2010, Williston charged East Hampton High School $11,135 for ice time. And last year, they charged $6,000. So the deduction in fees is reflected primarily in the cost of ice time. Okay, and that would be divided upon um, in the entire team? The entire team. And, and how so many players are on a team? Yes. So um, last year, there were 19 total players. Six were from East Hampton High School, five were from Hampshire Regional, two were from Smith Vocational, and six were from Northampton High. Okay, and then um, back to the fees. You said right now we have five players playing and one is paying nothing because of free lunch. However, when you were reading down the, um, the breakdown, I thought you said that for free and reduced it's 35, 25, 25. It is, except he is a, he is a, they are free lunch students, which means they do not pay any fee. Any fee. Reduced lunch pays the oh, 35, the 25, 25. But free, uh, free lunch received, they do not, they are not charged. Okay, and then um, where did you come up with the fee of leaving it at 350 when we're looking at per player of $821? Um, I'm trying to maintain the cost per parent, per student athlete that was in place last year and, in, and the year before. Um, because I felt it was inappropriate to increase the fee without having a process in place for better understanding the, the overall costs. I am very much aware that the $350 is only, only covers about $1,750 to our cost and the athletic budget is paying about $3,000 um, out of its budget um, to cover the remaining costs. Okay, um, one second please. So, <coughs> go ahead. You want to be after. <coughs> I, I'm just concerned about the, the fact that this is tied into gate sales from what you're saying. So you don't ever, you can't ever budget ahead for our total cost because they're not giving you a total cost until after the season's over. Yes. Or should we be concerned about how dramatically gate sales can be different or are they pretty traditional? Well, like, do they stay pretty stable? Because that, um, seems, that seems a little... Well, well, it seems I like about say, your dollars to play hockey is normal. The, the, gate, the gate receipts from the very first year that we were participating they were $5,600. The gate receipts last year were $3,500. So, so you, I, there is definitely cause for concern about how, how much of the gate fee or gate receipt, I should say, is going to benefit us in the long run. Um, so you could end up not, not budgeting enough for it if you have a bad year where people just don't show up for the games? Yes. Oh, that's kind of problematic. Yes. 
So it's sorry, I just want to be clear. <coughs> The other, piece that's, the other piece that's problematic when I'm looking over these numbers is that we are charged for the coach's salary um, and in no other, with our, with our other sports, the coach's salaries are paid for s separately in the teacher's contract, whereas the coach's salary here is um, in included in the cost. So our kids, are, our kids and the athletic budget um, are paying for the, the coaches' fees, the coaches' salaries, I should say, which is not the way it currently works for the for the rest of our program that I'm that I'm responsible for. I think we should move it to like rules and policy and to go look at it. And I don't understand how we can really make a decision other than to leave it at the same as it is now, only because we don't have all the information that we need. We need to go through and uh, <coughs> address all the other information as far as how it is for sport because. Another concern I have is, let's say soccer yeah. in, in the middle school. Well if, if my and my, I had sisters that played ice hockey, so I know way back, thirty years ago, it was a lot of money. Then it was like eight hundred dollars for so, a private. So I think I think um, what Mr. Prey is here tonight is to make a recommendation that we leave the fee structure as it is, and then as the budget season comes around, to have a more robust and healthy discussion around what the fees should be, and then at that point we would work at making mm -hmm. that. Uh, number put back into the budget. Yes. I understand that. Right. So. I understand that. But I'm just so. wondering, I mean, how long are we voting on this, this figure for? For this year. Okay. Only for this year yes. so that we can that put it in the vote that we can turn around and look at it and review it and just keeping it so that it's here? Because if, and if that's the case, then why are we voting on it? Because it's already because was there. Because there. Never, that's, and so two years ago, since these fees have been in place, they never we took never it. had a vote on it here at the school committee. Okay. So that was uncovered as the, all this work was done around the fee. And so Ms. Dupre is here just to kind of formalize the fee structure. Right, but she's also going to be looking at things in the future. And my That's question right. is, while well, she looks at that in the future, of looking at all, like how much it costs for somebody, for a child to play soccer um, on like Northampton Soccer Club versus how much it costs for somebody to go out and play ice hockey, but not sanctioned through the school. That's what I was looking at. And when you look at the whole picture, that's what I'm hoping also gets in included, is how much, because we've been paying for our kids to play sports all the way along. Nobody really just stop, starts ice hockey, you know, on a competitive level in 10th grade, pretty much. I mean, maybe some do, but for the most part, people don't just go in and get in on teams. So they've been playing. So is it, I mean, in ice hockey, is it going up and then all of a sudden they get to high school and it's like, phew, we play a lot less. Whereas in soccer, for $175, and my daughter plays soccer, it's a lot less than that she pays now. And so when she goes to the high school and pays soccer, it's going to be, whew, that's a lot more. That was my question. I understand. I, I don't think there, um, it, from the conversations I've had with the parents as well, it's, I, it's I don't think there's any argument that um, hockey is a very expensive sport and that $350 <coughs> um, is a very reasonable price to play hockey, but I think more the concern was that um, there was no process in place for formally presenting this and having the community hear it and be able to voice concern before arbitrarily ch changing it. And once that was revealed, that's why I'm here. Okay. So. And I'd like to recognize the superintendent who wanted to add something to this. Thank you. I, I just wanted to say that I think the proper venue for the issues to be vetted is through the budget. And one of the reasons why this recommendation is being made at this time is we're in the middle of a budget season and we're also in the middle of an athletic season. And so we just need uh, authorization to move forward with this season. As we develop a new budget, we'll be looking at the athletic program as a whole rather than looking at individual sports within the athletic program and making individual determinations. I think we have to consider what does it cost to run an athletic program that includes all the sports we anticipate having within it and what's a rational fee structure that allows us to support that. I'd like to make a motion then to accept the $350 fee if it that is so that we have it on the books until we review everything as he stated. I'll second that. Can I just ask for one point of clarification? The limitation of the application of the $350 fee to the family cap, is that also as it stands now, or is that? that that's the current? That's currently how it stands. That's, and that's, OK. Is there any uh, question, further discussion on this motion? So just so we have the numbers right, uh, it, 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 
our discussion is around the three hundred fifty dollars for the, for the the hockey fee, but it, it also is to formalize the one seventy five, one forty five, one fifteen structure yes. along with the thirty five, twenty five, twenty five for the reduced lunch as well. Yes, and also the six hundred dollar family cap. cap. Okay. So is everyone's clear on the motion? It's been made and seconded. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? It carries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. We now have a uh, report. Uh, this is from Rules and Policy Subcommittee. Uh, this is, I believe, the final vote. We've taken, so we've done three readings. Mm -hmm. Reading so of, yes. Yes. Three times. Yes, so yes. now, um, Third time so now we, this would be the final vote on the advertising contract revision, uh, KHB.E, um, as well as the advertising in the schools, delegation of authority, limitations and restriction policy revision, that's KHBR. Um, I don't know whether folks would like to take those two together as a I vote. I would move approval of both policies as amended. Okay. Second. Any further questions or discussion about these two policies? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so those policies, um, after a long and winding road, have been adopted. <laughs> uh, and I believe now we move to item F, uh, and uh, the superintendent has some uh, actually recommended policies that need review. Yes, thank you. So I have four specifically I'd like to bring to your uh, attention tonight with the hope that these may go to policy and rules subcommittee. The first is policy CH, which is policy implementation. As we were going through the process of a policy KHBE and KHBR, one of the discussions was for such a minor change it was really um, unfortunate that we had to go through three months of reading. So um, the goal with looking at this would be to see if there's a way to modify the policy so that when we had minor changes to make to a policy, if we could do it in a more streamlined way. The second policy is IKF graduation requirements to reflect the eventual recommendations of the ad hoc committee um, to come into compliance with the state requirement on physical education. Um, our graduation requirements are included not only in our student handbook but in the policy and so um, when the <coughs> committee is able to make its recommendation and pending approval of the school committee I think we should be ready to move to bring that policy into alignment with that. The third policy is ACAC, Bullying and Harassment. In spring of 2014, the legislature made some changes to the act relative to bullying in schools, specifically um, changing some definitions and adding some protected classes. And so I think it's just a matter of bringing the language of our current policy into alignment with those changes in the statute. And finally, uh, policy DBJ, which is budget transfer authorization. Um, and our, our reason for wanting to uh, have an amended policy there is so that we can implement a more accountable budget process that um, requires cost center managers if they're going to overspend in a line item to identify another budget source that they want to uh, use for that and allow us to um, authorize spending for those transfers within line items um, and pay bills in a, in a timely way in between school committee meetings. So those are the four that I would recommend should be next on deck for a review by our policy subcommittee. So is there a motion to, uh, to we'll refer, refer those? Refer those to rules and policy. <clears throat> so there's been a motion made and seconded to refer those uh, mm -hmm. policies outlined by the superintendent to uh, your committee for review and a recommendation. Is there any uh, discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so those will, uh, those will be reviewed the, by the committee. Next, we have, a, um, we have some further gift votes. Uh, it's definitely the season of gifts uh, this evening. Um, 
we have a planned gift of, uh, uh, and I don't believe this is a state planning. I think it means it's a gift that's going to be coming, uh, anticipated in the future. Um, it's uh, a gift from Green Street Brew a cappella group, and I'll have uh, 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 Ms. Walczak explain that one for us. Yes, we were contacted. Um, this group holds a performance each March, sometimes at Northampton High School. This year it happens to be at Amherst High School for scheduling reasons. And what they would like to do this year is donate 50% of their proceeds to Northampton High School and the other 50% they're proposing to Amherst High School. They're looking for permission in advance so that they can advertise the function and, and indicate in their advertising where the proceeds from the performance will be going to. They're estimating pace, based on their past history that it would be approximately $1,800. They would like to have that those funds dedicated to the arts program and if possible to our music program since it's coming from a musical performance. Okay. So the request, I guess, is to um, vote in to accept anticipated gifts from uh, from this uh, a cappella performance. I'll make a motion to accept the gift in the future from the 50% um, proceeds from the a cappella with the intention for it to go to the music program. And I know that we don't normally do that, but I think we should. So that's my motion. Okay. Is there a second on that motion? Second. Okay. Mr. Meyer? Well, I just, well, as uh, Mr. Val said, that our, our normal policy is that while we take into account and make every effort to use a gift as designated, that we generally do not accept restrictions. I think that should go to rules and policy. I think we should review that because I think that it's prohibitive in times and we've actually, like, lead school the computers and um, you know I mean sometimes it cuts our nose off to not accept the gift and then we ended up accepting it at lead school ultimately but they had wanted to give it before they didn't they didn't require it. they said preferably so right. I think they're giving us the out right yeah I think that they're just expressing a preference that right. they'd like so, to see it go to the music also program the preference in the so you're the one putting it. It. okay okay right. they specifically asked for the arts right for the okay. arts so if it's not committed to the arts I think there would be an issue the right. preference within the arts program the preference is to the music program but so we normally wouldn't even say the arts we right would leave it completely and that's why I think we need to leave <coughs> it because why else would they want to I mean have it go to the phys ed department you know I mean it just makes no sense I think that we need to be respectful if people are going to be giving us money and have it go towards it I also think historically that the uh, school department has made every effort to try to use the money in the area which it was hopefully designated for but in the unforeseen uh, reason for the monies to be allocated or used somewhere else. It has always been at the school uh, department's discretion to do so. But historically, when gifts come in earmarked for certain things, it's usually the, uh, the school department's uh, the school department normally honors that request. And in the past, I want to say it's not like so that we think that it comes in and then we normally honor it. When it hasn't been and, and when there has been an issue with it, it's been an active discussion as far as the issue. So it's not like if we're not going to take the gift, we're just going to go behind their back and say, you know, let's send it to phys ed anyway. It, 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 would, it would become a, an issue. I mean, we've discussed it in the past of, well, these are the reasons why or why not. So it's not just there. I, I think that... <clears throat> For me, the issue is that a gift with conditions attached, those are legally binding. So if you accept a gift with conditions attached and then you try to spend it for another purpose, then the donor may ask for the gift to be returned. I agree. And I think that that's why in the past we've, you know, we've communicated with donors clearly that we will do our best, as, as the vice chair said. I just, again, it, it may be something to go to rules and policy, but it just seems like to make that your motion included the intent to restrict the gift and I and again and I think it should because I mean I, I, and that's why I think it should go to rules and policy and I thought that for a long time is we need to look back at rules and policy for the gift for our gift uh, you know look at changing it because that may be a change that we might not be able to do in the short term right we're, we're looking at the long term but we're looking right. at a vote for right now but the vote for right now is is a a music group offering us half of their revenue I think we should respect for it to go into at least the minimum of the arts, and if not, music. I mean, we have a budget for it, so why, so why not? Don't we, um, why don't we separate this out, take a vote on the gift, 
and then if you'd like to make a motion to refer this policy to rules and policy for further study we can do that so I would love to do that okay I've been wanting to do that for a while okay so the question though is I just want to clarify what the motion was because the motion was to accept the gift um, or the intent it, um, but and you wanted to express the intent that it go to the arts that it go to the arts uh, and 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 hopefully the music and, and as requested and right Preferably the music department as requested right so um, that's kind of like whose intent <laughs> is that the intent of the, the donor, donors the, the donor I think I think the intent of public schools the donors intent. The donors intent I believe yes and it's their intent too. she's echoing the donors intent well, they say earmarked what's that they wrote earmarked yeah. music enrichment right um, I don't know uh, um, that's what yeah. it says. okay yeah and have it earmarked for music enrichment mm -hmm. but did they ask for earmark is that your writing as well? the back sheet is prepared by the donor okay the front sheet is my summary before I had actually received the back sheet okay. and I did send the front sheet to the donor to review to make sure I had worded it properly and then she sent the backup to us I you know I we may be getting into the weeds here because I, I don't know that the average I you know donor thinks about this and may just have been using the term earmark you know probably not I mean I, I really don't feel we're getting into the weeds I mean I, I uh, having worked in the school district that had stark differences between public support for different schools and certain schools had better facilities mm -hmm. just clearly better facilities mm -hmm. because their parent communities were able to give more money and there was no policy within that district to even encourage the distribution of funds. I think that we as a district do better to, as the same way we did with that donation, a large donation to lead school, express to that donor that it could not be restricted as a term of the gift, that we would do our best. But otherwise, I think we as a district, we come down to those parent communities that are wealthier can then drive their donations to particular purposes um, and, and just assume that they will drive our budget process to a certain extent because once the money is committed in that area, then are we, you know, if we withdraw money and reallocate it out of that area, then they feel like they, as a donor, have been somehow punished for donation. Right. So I think I think it's a I think it's a significant policy change, and that's why I wouldn't I would not again I would rather have the conversation just as we did in the lead situation, have the conversation with the donor that if the policy of the Northampton Public Schools to accept gifts and attempt to the extent possible to apply it, but we cannot make a promise that we would do that because that's accepting a gift with a condition which is not a general practice. There's a big difference between accepting gifts from families and individuals in the schools and the schools versus a group or an organization wanting to give us gifts. And that's, I guess, where the clarification. I, I understand totally, in fact, I'm an advocate for somebody for the equity issues that, that are involved there when it's personal. But when we're talking about groups or organizations, I think that it's, it's very, very different and they're not being restrictive. You know, I mean, they're they're being they're saying this is what we do, and we would like to advertise. Just, I mean, theaters do it for theater. I mean, phys ed does it for phys ed. Everyone does it for themselves. You know, it's not a matter of a school. You know, saying, well, this is what we're going to do for our school, so our school is more ahead. So Leeds is the only school with um, computers, but everybody else doesn't. I mean, you know, that's an equity issue. We're not really talking about an equity issue. This is going to the music program. They're not spe specifying where exactly or to whom it has to be. So it's a general gift for all of, for everybody, for the music, for our, all of our students, as opposed to when a parent from one of the schools or something. So that's why I would ultimately like to break it in half and send it to the policy, because there's different ways of looking at it uh, for the equity issues and fairness. I just, what I meant by getting down to the weeds was start holding a rules and policy committee meeting no, no, tonight I, I, uh, and debating the, the specific. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. So, um, so would you, uh, are you comfortable with the motion as it's presented? Uh, do no, you want I, to I tend to vote against it because I think it's changing our past practice. I okay. would rather have the conversation with the donor before we go forward. Okay. Did would the you... donor have a deadline that they needed to have this voted on? I mean, is this something simple that could... I think they wanted to so? advertise on their posters that proceeds mm -hmm. will but go they, to... They, don't, don't but the proceeds could say, it could say Northampton Public Schools, so we could certainly express our intent to accept that the Northampton Public Schools will accept the gift. I don't think the poster... I, I don't know if it's not dedicated to the arts okay. if they would make the donation. I mean, the right. conversation was very clearly for the arts program. And we do want to put STEAM into STEM, so I don't think that we should cut off our nose despite our face, and I think we need to review the policy to look at it, whether or not that's exactly what we're doing with it. 
So, <laughs> so we have an, we have a, um, a a motion on the table to accept the gift. Uh, well, With the preference for it to be earmarked. It's not actually a gift, but it's we're giving them authoriz future authorization, I guess, saying that we will we will accept a future gift because we don't know what the actual gift is or what the dollar amount is. Um, and the motion <coughs> expresses the same intent that, that the donor has expressed that it should go toward the arts um, and preferentially the, uh, the music, right. music program. Right. Is um, it intent binding? Right. Um, no, I'm asking. I don't know. Is, when you say with the intent, is that binding or is that just? No, oh, we intend for it to go. I mean, some things happen. That's, I, I, just, I know nothing about it. Yeah. If, we, if we vote to accept, well, if we vote to accept, and then the funds come in, can then we vote again to accept the, the financial portion of it? Are we bound to accept it since we've taken this vote, or could we not accept it? My intention would be, based on what I've done historically, is that it not need to come back a second time to speed up the process. I have frequently come to the school committee on behalf of various things, from athletic teams and boosters to to a sermon of donation saying if we do this will you accept our donation and ideally we want to approve it yes. before any fundraising of any sort is done to come back a second time just delays making that deposit and being able to do what the intent was so when I've done these before it's been with the once the vote happens to say we will accept the gift when that day comes when the check comes in that it does not come back to the school committee for a second vote because you basically have already said you're going to accept it. It would be very embarrassing at that point to say, well, we know we gave you approval three months ago, but now that you're here with the check, <laughs> we've changed our minds. Because we want to use it for something else. So now we'll take nothing. I, I, my, my motion isn't, isn't like we are going to do it with the intent to follow through as the donor wished. I mean, that's our, that's our, our, our intent, I would think. Okay. We've made that intent before for other um, gifts. So we have a motion made and seconded. Is there any other questions or discussions yeah, about? I'm sorry. I really need. I feel like I'm not a new member anymore. Yeah. Thanks to you, but <laughs> um, I don't really get this because to me, I want to accept this, and I feel like it's not being well. It's only going to the high school. This is going to this program. I don't care if it's arts or music. Nothing is a wash in money, right? right. And that it so it doesn't seem like an equity issue. It seems like we could use it. So to me, I want to say, yeah. yeah. But then I hear Downey, and are we voting on something we're, we're just automatically knowing we're going against policy? Right. And no, then we've that done that in, in the past. It's not that we know that we're going. I, you know, it, that's why I carefully one-worded it with, as far as that goes with the preference. to. We've done that in the past. We've, we've said yes with the intent and the hope to be able to have it go towards leads. I mean, there was an example of that. If you go back and you look at the motion there, I mean, we had a lot of talking about before we accepted that, and they finally did. And that is an equity issue, and it still is an equity issue. This is not an equity issue, and it's telling them that it's just basically saying that we would hope to do the intent. And we always have. I can't think of a time, and I'd like, I wish Lisa Minnick were here today, to tell of us, us of a time when we've said, you know, what even though the money came for this let's send it spend it somewhere else we really haven't you know from everything that I've known since I've been new to the board so. I think it's really the understanding that the donor has that we will make the attempt to right. use the funds as asked that they would yeah. be used but we don't guarantee that it will right. happen that's all and I'm not sure that that's happened with the conversation that Ms. Walzik has had with this donor I did not tell her that we would try our best. I mean, my history from all my years of dealing with gifts is when a gift is made for a purpose, we are obligated to do that, and right. I, it hasn't usually been an issue, but I understand if you're dealing with a, a larger issue that there could be an equity issue, and I think the choices are you accept the gift they want to donate it for or you don't accept the gift. Exactly. I don't know that we want to be saying, well, we'll take your gift and we'll try to do it, but we might do something different. Right. Um, you know, when somebody's making a donation, they're making it for a specific purpose, and then your role is to say we accept it for that purpose or we don't. And that's why I want to refer to really changing the policy, because that's been the problem that I've had ever since I've been on this committee, is that if someone's accept giving us a gift with as much as our budget is, why not? Because when Leeds ended up getting the gift, when it came time to allocate other funding for computers and whatnot, they didn't have to get it out there because Leeds already had some. So we ended up being able to put the money elsewhere to, you know, somebody's got to get it first. 
But that's an equity issue. I still have an issue with that. This I don't because it's going to the arts. And I have a problem with what we've done to the arts over the years. Why would we even think to not accept the gift for the arts? OK. Is that clearer to you now, Ms. Hennessy? Sure. <laughs> OK. <laughs> but not Laura. I really don't want to drag this out. I'm sorry, but can I just well, so I, what I what I don't want to happen is that we have a vote and we have a you know a really confused or conflicted vote. I want right. it to be so clear my, for so people. Question, so what I'm understanding part of the problem with this is, for instance, if we're going over on HVAC unforeseen issues, the money has to come from somewhere because we can't go over. We have to have a balanced budget. So is the question in an emergency that we can't promise that this money's going there because if it comes down to it and our cables are cut and we have no, and we can pay for that and the HVAC system, we didn't account for enough or heating costs go up, that in desperate situation where we have to balance the budget, we okay. could potentially use this money I I, yeah, for something I, like that. Is I, that I, what we're talking no, about? I, I, it's different I, category. I, I, no, or is it I, really yeah. just a gift with strings attached? I, I we don't want to set a precedent. About, I think it's more the gift with strings attached okay. because the, I mean, the city receives gifts all the time and we set up a gift account. I mean, we set up a gift fund, and we put the money in the gift fund, and we have lots of, okay. um, you know, lots of those kinds of gifts. So, um, but with but, strings but attached, sounds more, harsh. It's not real. Yeah, I this mean, is, it is more. This is more of a policy on the school committee related to okay. equity among okay. all students, all schools. Mm -hmm. um, and this doesn't affect it. So okay. that's the. Sorry, so I just want to be I clear. I know what I, I'm doing I here. I personally don't believe it's a budgetary. <laughs> <laughs> circuit breaker kind of an issue. I think this is really a policy related to equity and okay. and fairness okay. and not creating a two-tiered okay. uh, system based on if you had a wealthier part mm -hmm. of the city that could give more donations to one you know particular school. I think that's the clearly the issue. Okay. Um, so, but yeah. not in this case. In this case, it isn't that that isn't the issue. That's the issue of our original policy, which is why we need to send it back and be able to say. You know, and delineate at that point what the issue is. Because right now, this is an organization that's giving it to the arts, preferably music. They're not saying kindergarten, they're not saying anything. They're just, and what it is, is it's reflective of their own culture of what they value. And, and I think that, that we should be respectful to that when it doesn't, especially when it doesn't, ha you know, confront equity issues. And it doesn't. I mean, unless you can see where it does, Mayor. Uh, I'm really not the best person to judge that. I'd have to, you know. I don't, I don't, I'm not quite, I'm sure you could make an argument about, you know, you could probably figure out an argument about that, but I, I don't really, I don't know enough about the organization or the event or any of that stuff, so, yeah, it's not my role to judge that. Yes? Yeah, I still haven't decided how I'm going to vote on this particular motion in front of us, but um, if you pardon me, I'll, I've been thinking out, thinking in my head, and I want to think out loud, and you can maybe correct my thinking here, but a big part of this, what I'm seeing is the tension here, you know, why this is not an obvious discussion, why is there a confusing discussion. For me, I think comes down to sort of two parts. One, you know, the fungible nature of money, right? It goes into the budget and you can't tell which dollars are which. So as long as the amount of the gift is less than the total amount spent in that line item, you don't really know if it's those dollars or you know, other dollars. And so it comes down to then the question when you say is it going to be directed towards a particular fund, what you're really saying is it going to be in addition to the amount which otherwise would have been spent? Right? Is that pretty clear? Mm. Is that what, right? Yes, yeah, so you're Did saying. You say, I and just, and, I and so then, and then, you're, and then you get into this difficulty with the budgeting, which is, that if, you know, um, so you get this amount of money, and it's more than what was already budgeted. And I don't know, you know, it depends how it would fall in terms of, you know, fiscal years and the way money is being spent in the budget. But um, then, do, you know, does it get carried over to next year's budget? If those dollars weren't spent this year, do you know, do we spend off the top? I, I, think, I think, you know, trying to turn dollars into, into non-fungible things, and we're trying to say this X number of dollars, or these are the dollars that have to be spent here, whereas these other dollars, which are the ones we budgeted um, independently, we could move around if we wanted to, but those we can't. I don't know how you can tell the difference between 
those dollars. I can. And, 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 and I can tell the difference. <laughs> yeah. So, so what happens when we get when we get a monetary <laughs> gift and it, it goes yeah. into what we call in our jargon a revolving account? It does yeah. not go into the school committee budget. So it is separately tracked mm -hmm. so that I can identify exactly when and where the money went into okay. and then how it gets used. So what you need to be able to do in these cases is if the donor comes back and questions us. Mm -hmm. We gave you $1,750 for the arts program and we're hearing nobody got anything. What did you do with that money? I have to be able to go into our accounting records and pull it out and say, here's what we did. We paid $400 for a trip to the symphony. We paid $300 to repair the trombones. You know, I'm not a music person. Right, right. But yes, we can definitely account for those. And it doesn't, get, it doesn't get mingled in yeah, with um, the school committee budget, for lack right. of a better word. Right, but, so. but it does in a way, though, because if you, you know, as I think Danny alluded to this, that it, it can cut both ways in terms of whether or not people are willing to contribute to the schools, because if if they contribute and then we subtract off of our budget, you know, that's the thing. So in fact, the total amount spent remains the same. Mm -hmm. You know, that that that's a disincentive to make contributions. People want their contribution to be on top of what's being done, not just sort of to replace the operating yes. budget. And for me, that's where this whole conversation gets pretty complicated in terms of your emotion, which sort of says, we're definitely going to spend that much money more than our current budget. I don't know that we can promise that. And at the same time, I understand that's the intent, and I understand that that's, I mean, I understand that's the intent of the people who are giving it, and I would like to honor that. Well, so if we don't promise we it, then we're not going to spend it. So if we don't promise it, then we don't get it, then there's no issue. No, I mean, no, so no, what I said is, if we don't I don't know that, that we can promise that we will, we will honor, you know, that we can say that we will spend that amount of the gift more than what we would have otherwise spent. I just don't know that, you know, because as the year plan pans out, you know, budget amounts. So. But if it's a gift and it goes into that account, then we have to, to, to treat it that way, and we have to be able to record it and everything. Oh, no, no, I'm understanding that. I'm understanding the revolving account part. I'm talking about the rest of the money that's spent but you're not, on but, the arts. But then that would require coming back. And, and taking money out of the budget. And when we sit there and we go through the budget line, somebody's going to say, why did we take all this money out of the arts budget? And then the business manager's going to say, well, we thought we would just, you no, know, replace it. it's not taking money out it. of the arts budget. It's you are if you're going to be replacing it with the You get to the end of the account. year, and we don't spend zero in every single one of, you know, mm -hmm. we don't spend down to zero. We have surplus in some places and deficits in others. And, and you know, and, and so that's how it happens. It's not a matter of, of changing the budget. If that happens, do you take money out of the gift accounts? Well, no. No, I guess, I mean, the piece, I'm, I'm torn with jumping in here because I hate to prolong this too, and I hope the yeah, donor sorry. isn't watching this discussion because it's yeah. nothing personal for this donation. I don't know if this will help or not. The expense money, the expense portion of the budget has already been allocated to the principals. I have to assume that every principal, since they have very little money, is going to spend all the expense money that belongs to them, whether they get the donation or not. Right. So. A good chunk of that is spent already this year, and by the time this donation comes in in March or April, their money should be almost all gone. So on the assumption that a principal is going to spend all, the ex all of the small amount of expense money given to them, because most of our budget is salaries and utilities and tuition, um, on the assumption the principal spends that whole 2% of the budget that they, yeah, yeah. they get that's theirs, this would be on top of that. Okay. Um, part of the principal's job to, should be make sure that they do spend all the money that is available in those expense accounts. Mr. Meyer? I, just, I mean, I guess I'm just curious. Our policy, and we just had a discussion about how it takes us so long to change mm -hmm. policies. Our policy states any gift of cash, whether or not intended by the donor for a specific person, will be handled as a separate account and expended at the discretion of the committee. Well, the that's, 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 what our, that's, that's what our policy says. So. I mean, again, if we want to change our policy, but I'm, I don't know how we can, in a motion, just say let's yeah. let's ignore our right. policy, mm -hmm. that that we as a committee have had discussions about, chose not to change at our last discussion. I mean, that's again, I hate feeling like the ogre, but I do think we as a committee, that holding to our policies and and treating donors in the same way is important to me. I mean, yeah, and what I would just I was about to say kind of the same thing is the school committee voted on that policy because that's the policy that the school committee wanted to follow and you're opening floodgates if you just start willing you know saying okay we're going to overturn this policy tonight because that's what we feel like doing we can't do that we have to stick to our rules and policies and the procedure is that we take it to subcommittee and the subcommittee discusses whatever issue it is and 
as we had tonight, it comes before us three times before we vote on it. And I think that's the appropriate way to handle it. And that, you know, that procedure I have a question up. for the superintendent and or the business manager, <laughs> as far as that goes. Um, what do you think? <laughs> There's my question. What do you think, sir? Being, and well, the question is actually, both of you have worked in other districts. So I'm sure, as you've already said, that, that you've taken in gifts. And I mean, have you seen this to be a major problem before? And also, just what do you think? So I guess just with respect to the question that's before the committee at this moment, I think it's important that the committee not take a vote that violates its own policy. I think that um, the policy itself may be limiting um, in the sense that it may discourage donations. But if that's the case, then that needs to be a discussion separate from this vote on this one gift. So what would you recommend us to do? Just go back, like, like um, Downey says, and, and talk to them and say, well, you know, we may or may not, although in the past we never really have spent it anywhere we wanted, but you know, because I understand from the donor's point of view, and I understand that you're saying it's a policy and we do need to address it, but also from the donor's point of view and from the fact that our, we've, arts has taken so many hits in our school, I think that there should be some way that we accept it with a lot of gratitude. I think the prudent, I think the prudent uh, step would be to re reform your motion to just vote to accept the gift to, on behalf of the Northampton Public Schools. Take that vote, just just straight up like that, and then refer the policy to committee for discussion. So that we can going forward, we'll have a clear, a better understanding of what the majority position is of the committee on this issue. Okay, I will change my motion. Okay. I would like to make a motion to accept the gift with sincere gratitude from all of us. Is there a second? Um, for the purpose of discussion, I'll second. It is okay. okay. So, so could I amend that? <coughs> accept the gift subject to the donor's understanding of the Northampton public school's policy on gifts. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that that's... Well, I'm sure she's got to go back and tell them now. Well, no. Well, I mean, if we only accept the motion as that, then she has to go back well, and no, talk I'm to them. If, 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 if I'm understanding you're, you're accepting the gift, I wouldn't want them to misunderstand that, okay. they're, that they had required the gift to be expended in the way that they outlined in the letter that was given to us from right, the business but manager. I'm saying that... We're accepting the gift. If they don't want to give it to us, I'm assuming that because of all of the requirements, Stumman's has to go back already and tell them this if they're not watching. Hello, you know. But I, well, I, I want I just Mr. Myers clar clarify that their amendment that there. speaks to again speeding the process up. If we can pass in uh, the motion this evening with his language, then Ms. Walsh can speak to the donor, and if approved, then everything continues yes. smoothly. And there's no further problem. That's fine. If you want to do the legal jargonese and all of that, that's fine. But I just, I just think that it's a horrible, horrible policy, not to be respectful to people um, who want to give to the arts or to anything that's actually helpful to our students. I mean, we just had Valley Gives yesterday, and we all went out and got everything. And I could go on and on, but I'm not going to. But I just think it's a horrible policy. So, um, so will you accept the friendly amendment? I'll accept to the, the amendment that he wants. Okay. Sure. So the friendly amendment is accepted. So the gift is accepted pursuant to the school committee's gift policy. Yes. Essentially is what you're saying. Okay. But you know, in the past we've also said, and you've said yourself, Mayor, that with the hopes, in the with the hopes that it goes, that that's actually been in motions in the past where you've said with the hopes, it doesn't have to be with the yeah. well, I mean as, I remember that. As chair I don't make motions, but I Well no, I mean but the, the motion has been made that way. Okay. You're I, the I one would, that I would assume and I would hope that the conversation that the business manager has with the potential donor mm -hmm. is to explain that we have a policy against accepting restricted cash gifts. However, that the discretion, that that language, the discretion of the school committee means that we will use best efforts to apply it in a way that is in keeping with their intent. See, and I think that should be in the motion. I, yeah. But you don't. That's fine. I don't really care at this point. I okay. think it's all ridiculous. Okay, so we have a motion that's been made, withdrawn, made again, and amended, 
and second and, like, and so um, let's all sing together <laughs> all those in favor <laughs> acapella style I opposed <laughs> any objections not an objection but abstaining okay. you're yes, I would abstain so you're abstaining I'm abstaining because okay. I think that we should just accept okay. it with gratitude to them okay you're listening that's so, me Please note for the record that the maker of the motion abstains on the motion. Okay. So uh, we um, we now have another another gift. Uh, this is actually um, uh, a <coughs> gift in the form of a uh, a, a gift certificate or a prize uh, that uh, I won. that uh, Ms. Duval won at a recent conference, uh -huh. and I believe it's a thousand dollars. Of legal services from the law firm of Koppelman and Page, um, and so uh, I, w I would uh, I, I'll entertain a motion to accept this gift. Um, I make a motion to accept this gift with gratitude. Okay. I'll second it with gratitude. Well, that was a lot of walking around to win this gift. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Uh, we have another gift. This is um, PTO teacher grants uh, for the high school. And I'll have uh, Ms. Walczak explain this. Yes, there are four gifts this year from the um, high school PTO. They're designated for certain teachers. I'll just read them for the public record. There's $550 to Lisa Leary for a student art show at Forbes Library, completion of a Saul Witte installation and materials for the art mural in the boys' second floor restroom, $250 to Jeremy Whalen for a student photography exhibit, $800 to Blue Flay High for transportation expenses for the choral groups to travel to city schools to do performances, and $900 to Sue Biggs for the Chemistry Olympiad. Okay. How does that differ from the other one? When all of this is are saying where it's going, it's a gift. How does that differ from the other one? I mean, if I have to make a motion to discuss it first, I'll make a motion to dis approve if that's what we have to do. I believe that, uh, because this is a grant program, I believe it's probably similar to the NEF. 10 NEF grants that we accepted earlier tonight that um, folks went through a process, they applied, um, and... Uh, so where does that fall in our policies, in our gift taking? Where does this all fall in our policies? I mean, since the other one was, where does this one fall? Uh, that's Down probably it? an issue for oh, us. I would, I, would, I would accept the mayor's reasoning that it is, in fact, distinguishable because there is a grant application process. But do we have a policy in there that, that, that addresses that as far as accepting and then stating exactly where it can go? I don't know if our policy addresses that particular, whether you consider this a cash gift. But if you were to use that reasoning, then you would say that our Title II money was a cash gift from the United States government that we would use at the discretion. Well, there you so have it. We don't do that because it's a, it's a it's not. grant. So it's different. Yeah, so I, I mean, I'm, I'm fairly certain the teachers apply PTO for these grants, and they go through a process much like the NEF small grant process. And so it's been the tradition, the custom of the school committee um, to defer to those processes and to accept the accept the grant money. Uh, I move to accept it because I would never, unless it was a matter of equity, say no on a gift. I'm not going to look at gift horse in the mouth. Okay, is there a second to that motion? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Now we're moving into the non gift portion of the agenda, thankfully. <laughs> uh, and we have a vote on the um, early childhood home visitor job description. And I will turn this over to the superintendent. Thank you. Uh, I just want to uh, briefly explain the process by which this job description comes before you tonight because I think it represents two <coughs> potential departures from past practice. Um, one is with the, the process of approval of job descriptions themselves. Um, my understanding is that all job descriptions for school committee employees need to go before the school committee for approval which is why you see this tonight. Although 
I, I believe in the past um, that may not have happened. I just want you to know that we have coordinated with HR on this job description and gotten their blessing um, so that I can assure you that if you were to approve this job description as presented tonight, that it would not create a problem with the HR department. Secondly, um, the other departure was in, in the process of filling this position itself, which um, became possible because there was an increase in a grant to the early childhood program. At the time that Barbara Black, who's here tonight to talk about the job description, was informed of the increase in her grant. She said, well, what I really need is to have more home visiting services. And so I'd like to um, hire a second contractor to provide those services. There currently is a contractor for um, home visitation. And that, um, that set off some some warning flags for us because there's a three-pronged state test mm -hmm. for who may be a contractor. Um, the person has to be customarily engaged in whatever the work is. They need to be free from control uh, from the district and it needs to be outside the usual course of business of the district. So um, this is not the case for the person who's currently a contractor. So we said, why don't we address both issues at the same time? Have, um, have a job description approved for a home visitor and then convert the current contractor over to a, a school employee and have the new person come on as a school employee. <coughs> so. I'd like to um, make a motion to accept the new early childhood home visitor job description and position. Okay. As an employee versus the um, contractor. Is there a second on that motion? <clears throat> second. Okay. Uh, do, uh, do you have anything to add to that, Barbara, to that description? I don't. That was great. Um, <laughs> I, the one thing I have to add is that um, we, it's a position that will be somewhat fluid in that the hours are you know, there'll be a set number of hours, but depending on enrollment and you know, number of families we're visiting, it could fluctuate down a little bit. Um, so, but okay. no, but, and, and just to know, I guess for you to know, that it's part of our, oh God, I'm going to start talking in, in letters and in, um, <laughs> you know, in tongues. <laughs> community engagement grant, CFCE, which does a lot of work um, in the community, and it, the, the increase was specifically targeted. We didn't have a choice about what the increase could be used for. We already do this home visit program for um, families with toddlers, high needs families with toddlers, and well, 15 months to three years. And um, basically, the state said if you um, are willing to do home visits with five or more families, we'll give you this money. If you're not, we won't give you this money. Um, and since we are pretty sure there are an additional five families in our area that need the services, we said we'll take the money. So. Okay. Can I just ask, are there any additional, for instance, because our outside contractors going to school employees, are we now Excuse responsible me, for? She can't hear you. Oh. oh, I was just asking, are there additional expenses by converting them from an outside contractor to a school employee, like retirement funds and all that sort of stuff that are incurred? Both of these employees will be part-timers. They'll fall below the threshold for benefits. There is one significant difference, though, which I think is an important <coughs> benefit for home visitors, especially considering the type of work they're doing, which is that they would be able to um, have workers' compensation should something happen in the course of a home visit, which currently they're not able to receive. So we would, are we leaving ourselves open to a suit currently? I mean, or is, does, are they contracted saying that they absorb all responsibilities or whatever? I don't know what would happen in the case of a contractor visiting a home on our behalf and then having an injury or yeah. some other misfortune in the house. I think this might save us a lot of money. Did that answer your question? Yes. Okay. 
Any other questions about approving this job description? Okay. All those in favor of approving the job description, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So uh, it's approved. Thank you, uh, Barbara, for being here. Thank you. Okay. So we'll now move into the uh, business administrator's report and turn it over to uh, Ms. Walzik. So you've got the monthly budget report in front of you. In my cover letter, I outlined a couple of areas where deficits are showing and what the status of those is. I won't run through those, but I'll take questions if you have them. And the other note I made in here is we are beginning to run into a few areas outside of special ed where we know we have a couple of deficit issues we're addressing. But we're running into a few areas, particularly in maintenance, where we're beginning to see small deficits, especially in the heating area as we got the buildings up to speed with the heating season. So we are approving the repairs that are needed, and as we go forward analyzing this year's budget, we'll be looking to hopefully make some transfers from some other areas where there's savings into those maintenance accounts also. Okay. Are there questions uh, regarding the report? Questions about the, uh, the documents? Okay. Do you want to also move now to the personnel report? Yep, so for the month of November, we hired six, uh, five new employees, plus we were able to bring on six new subs. As you've heard, we've had an issue with getting subs on board, so that's something that we've really been concentrating on with the HR department. So we were able in November to bring on six, and I think we're going to find in December that we hopefully bring in more. Um, separations, we had five coaches who resigned, expected going into new seasons. That's not unusual. And then three ESPs who also resigned during the month of uh, November. Um, and then we had three promotions, which were essentially substitute employees that moved into ESP positions in the district, directly relating to the three resignations that we had. Okay. Any questions about the personnel report? Okay, so we'll now turn to the superintendent for his report. Thank you. Although it's been said many times in many ways tonight, uh, <laughs> I want to also um, just express my gratitude for all of those who participated in Valley Gives on behalf of any of the school projects. I have to tell you, it really was amazing. Um, I, I checked in on the website before coming to work yesterday morning and saw that Jackson Street already had $8,000. Um, I've been a part of other fundraising projects where it's taken months or sometimes even a whole school year to get up to $8,000. So to see what was able to be accomplished um, in such a short period of time was really amazing for me, uh, my first time through that process in Northampton. Um, I also would like to just make mention of a letter which the committee received regarding the uh, five consecutive days of parent-teacher conferences that are scheduled in October. Um, I just uh, wanted to, to, dis to bring that up. As, as you know, that is a matter that, that's included in the contract. Um, and I, I do think that the parents raise some very legitimate issues in that letter, but right now we're in the midst of executing a contract that has still a lifespan on it. Um, and I would be uh, interested in any direction the committee has for me on that. Um, and then moving on. Although it's been just over 15 school days since the last school committee meeting, it's been a busy time of building relationships that I think will help to sustain the work of the district moving forward. Um, on November 17th, I met with Jeff Harness and Joanne Marquez of Cooley Dickinson Hospital to discuss ways of strengthening our partnership on behalf of students. Following up on that meeting, I met with Mr. Lombardi and Ms. Biggs to begin thinking about curricular connections that might exist between our science program and the work being done at Cooley Dickinson. My hope is to continue this conversation over the course of the next several months to see how we can work <coughs> together to infuse the science curriculum with real world connections that can increase the relevance of the content and make it more engaging for students. Then on November 19th, I met with Mrs. Choquette and Dr. Hershowitz to discuss a potential partnership to enhance learning experiences at Bridge School. As you know, Dr. Hershowitz was a significant donor to the Bridge Street Playground project. At this point, um, he's interested in following up with a donation with an academic focus. 
Um, we're exploring the concept of adding a workstation for student collaboration in each of the classrooms, and that could give the school a big boost. Um, however, given tonight's conversation, um, yeah. I think I need some direction in how to go forward on this discussion. Um, so that's two things I need direction on. <laughs> um, also, on November 24th, I met with Ms. Agna and Tom Neils Duffy, the co-chair of the Jackson Street uh, PTO Playground Committee. Um, we discussed the CPA's approval of Jackson, C Jackson Street's request for 176,271. Uh, this matter is scheduled to be brought before the city council for a first reading on December 18th. Um, the total estimate for the project is about a quarter of a million dollars. So. Um, anticipating the council's approval of the CPA request and the money that was raised yesterday. I think we have about $50,000 to go on the playground project, um, but I'm very uh, hopeful for the future of that. So I would be uh, expecting the playground committee to be appearing before the committee shortly um, to discuss its plans with you. Then on November 25th, I met with Mr. Lombardi John Western, Mr. Peterson, and Mr. Lincolnhooker to discuss the future of the robotics team in a joint venture between NHS and Smith Volk. Um, even though our current club has had many successes, the current space at NHS is inadequate, and the lack of the met metal manufacturing equipment really places their products at a disadvantage when they have to go into competition with ironclad robots. Uh, <laughs> so I'll keep the committee advised as the partnership unfolds, but I can tell you the students and the advisors are very excited about the prospect of going from the age of wood to the age of steel. <laughs> and then on December 1st, I met with the Public Schools Action Coalition, a group of parents who, as they said, may not agree with me on everything, but are very interested in helping to spread the word about the good things that are happening in the Northampton public schools, um, and for it, really starting the conversation with parents about why Northampton offers a, a great option for kids in an environment that's rich with choices for education. On December 2nd, um, the ALT team met with Amtrak Officer Hansen to plan an education campaign for our students concerning the coming of high-speed rail lines to Northampton later this month. The theme of the campaign is Look, Listen, and Live um, through a combination of assemblies, publications, and other information sharing events. We're trying to get the word out to all that it's important to stay away from the tracks. Um, I'm not sure what the speed is going to be through town, but I know um, some of the speeds on the line will be 70 to 80 miles an hour, so um, it's very <coughs> important for our students and everyone to stay away from the tracks. And finally, um, yesterday, Deputy Fire Chief Benas and I attended a bomb threat assessment training. Um, the latest thinking in school responses to bomb threats is a real departure from the prior training that many of us received. And I'll be following up with our administrators and first responders to discuss any changes that we might need to make to our procedures in order to sort of come up to speed with the state of the art around bomb threat procedures. And that's my report. Okay. okay. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. I have a um, question. Just one question or comment on Smith Volk that, um, that mm -hmm. do they have? It's to interested students that are already from Smith Folk over with us, or I mean, because I know that they came with sports and stuff, or is this a new introduction for um, Smith Folk also? This is a brand new introduction for their students. Oh, so they must be pretty excited too. Thank you. Okay, I do not believe we have any new business plans. I do. For this evening. I have a business I'd like to bring up. Okay. Uh, well, we discussed it somewhat already. I would just like to refer the gift policy to the um, to the rules and policy committee. I don't know if that's the place to do it or whatnot, but that's, um, that's, I, we didn't ever make that motion to get it gone. Okay, so there's a motion it. to refer the, the committee's gift policy to the rules and policy committee. All right, to look at the whole okay. thing. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Thank you. So uh, remind folks that our next uh, school committee meeting is next year, January 8th, 2015, here at the JFK 
Middle School Room, 715 p.m. Uh, and now I would uh, ask uh, uh, the Vice Chair to make a motion uh, relative to the request for an executive session. All right, I'd like to make a uh, request for an executive session in JFK Principals Conference Room under Massachusetts General Law, over the meeting law for the approval of executive session minutes. June 12, 2014, and June 23, 2014, in Chapter 30A, Section 21A3, to discuss strategy with respect to litigation, civil action number 1430113MGM, and to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining, NACE, whereas an open session would have a detrimental effect, and further details would compromise the reasons for going in executive session second so there's a, been a motion made and seconded I'll ask the clerk to call the roll on that uh, vote. Ms. Laura Allen it's a yes, yes. or no oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes Ms. Pam Hanna yes Ms. Ann Hennessy yes Mr. Dan Meyer I Mr. Howard Moore yes Ms. Frank yes uh, Ms. Lubal yes Mr. Edward yes and Mayor Deidre yes Okay, so I must tell the public that uh, we are now going to um, uh, move into executive session. Uh, and we will, we're doing so obviously because to have this discussion in open session would have a detrimental effect um, on the issues before us. And we will, we will be adjourning from executive session. Okay. <laughs>